If you have a copy of God's Word, go ahead and find the book of Isaiah, chapter 54. Isaiah 54. Our students should know where that's located by now, since we've been working through the book of Isaiah this weekend. Isaiah 54, as we continue our series, Shepherd in the Shadow, speaking today about grace over shame. Ken Pagan had been infatuated with baseball since the age of eight. He had grown up and spent his whole life into his 40s playing and coaching the sport. His basement was full of baseball memorabilia, including signatures and signed articles from Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle. But now, he can't bring himself to watch his beloved Toronto Blue Jays. And it's not because of a dismal record. During the seventh inning of an American League wildcard game between the Blue Jays and the Baltimore Orioles at the Rogers Center in Toronto, in the middle of play, a beer can was flung from the stands and nearly hit an Orioles player in the act of making a catch. It was the lob heard around the world. Everything in the stadium froze. Everybody was stunned. The online mob immediately sprung into action to find the identity of the beer tosser. The Toronto mayor called the person a loon ball and urged fans to turn him in. The Toronto Sun newspaper offered a $1,000 reward for the name. A day and a half passed before Ken finally turned himself in. He was the beer tosser and he was charged for that by mischief with mischief by the police. Following that, there was a nine-month court case. He lost his job. He was publicly humiliated, and he received a temporary ban from every Major League Baseball stadium. A mild-mannered, now former journalist, he can't explain why he made the split-second decision, but it has been a source of abiding shame ever since, threatening to erase everything else he has achieved. Pagan said that he has been trying to remember... The person I was in the first 41 years of my life. Because that is the person I am. Not a drunk beer tosser brought down by Twitter. The feeling of unease is most acute for Ken whenever he catches a radio broadcast with play-by-play -play commentator Jerry Howarth, whose warm, nasally tone has been the voice of the Blue Jays since 1981. Ken says, when I hear that voice, I think of the disappointment I've brought to the organization. What was your moment? What split-second decision did you make? Or maybe it was the accumulated weight of hundreds of small decisions. I think each one of us can feel for Ken and, and connect with his story because most of us in here can connect at some level with shame. Our worst moments on display. Shame is one of the enemies, and you remember who the enemy is from last week. The enemy being the world that we live in with its brokenness and temptation. The, the sinful desires within us that threaten to leap out. The devil, our supernatural enemy and all of his minions. The enemy uses shame. It's one of his most powerful weapons. And long after the sin is over, the humiliation, the distress, and the fear of shame can still imprison us, even for decades. It can act as a relational arthritis in the church. People walk through these halls, sit in their small group, talk to other people, but they feel alone because of the things that they've done. It can poison friendships, which stay superficial because it's too dangerous to go deep. It can affect our family as kids hide from parents. Parents hide things from kids. Spouses hide things from each other. And dysfunction crops up. It can wreck our relationship with God as we believe that we have fallen short of his standard. And that while we might think grace is for everybody else, we struggle to believe that it's ultimately for us. But I have news for you this morning. God is not the author of shame. He does not call you unworthy. He does not bring up your past to remind you of it. He does not condemn you for what you have done. And this is evident in the very first few pages of our Bibles. In Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve are brought together in marriage. And the scriptures declare in verse 25 that they were naked and without shame. They had no sin. They had nothing to cover up. But in the next chapter, what do they do? They sin and they rebel and they get fig leaves to try to cover up their shame. But what does God do in response? 
God responds not by saying to Adam and Eve, you are condemned to walk the earth in nakedness and shame all your days. No, before the chapter is out, he makes a sacrifice and covers them with that sacrifice, hiding and covering their shame. God is a God who covers our shame with a sacrifice and he wants to break your shame today. Today. We're going to see that in Isaiah 54. I want to give you a little background before we dive in. Isaiah is looking ahead to the future here. And what he is saying is that hundreds of years, Israel and Judah, of your sin, your idolatry, your immorality, your injustice is going to lead to the judgment of God. And he is going to send you off into exile, into shame. He's going to bring in a foreign nation, Babylon, Assyria. They're going to wipe you out. They're going to take you off to a foreign land and drag you into exile. And you're going to carry with you the shame of your failure, the shame of your sins. You're going to be a defeated nation walking among a foreign people with no power and with only your shame to keep you comforted. But even though that's going to be true, God is not going to leave you there. In Isaiah 54, we learn what God is going to do with the shame of his people. In verse 4, we read this. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. God says, no more shame. Do not be ashamed. Do not be disgraced. In fact, you are going to forget your past shame. Your shameful status is going to be erased by me. Now, how is he going to do this? How do you deal with shame in your past? Well, our culture is no help here. They say, first of all, you shouldn't be feeling shame. There's nothing to be ashamed about. And if you do feel shame, you should just get over it. And maybe if it's really a struggle with you and you, you have shame, because our culture can't get away from this concept of shame, if you do feel that shame, just learn how to forgive yourself. But I've got news for you. You can stand in front of the mirror all you want. And you can look yourself in the eyes. And you can say, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. But it's not going to take care of your shame. No, what Isaiah is going to give us from the mouth of God, God is going to break the shame of his people. And he's going to do it by giving them powerful truth in which to live. Truth that's going to inhabit their lives and change the way that they think and feel. And that same truth is true for us today. And so here's the very first truth that we need to inhabit and take ownership of if we want to break the power of shame in our lives. Verse 5. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth, he is called. Did you just hear that? God turns to his people and says, your maker is your husband. Your God wants you, wants to attach himself to you. Now this truth is really neat in the Old Testament, but it takes on a whole better flavor in the New Testament. Where we learn that marriage itself is in fact a picture of the gospel. That in the gospel, we are the bride of Christ. Christ is our husband. We are his bride and we are united to him for all of eternity. Your maker, Isaiah says, God says, is your husband. And what a husband he is. First of all, he's your maker. The one who flung the stars into space. The one who crafted your DNA. That's the one who wants you. Oh, and by the way, he is the Lord of hosts. He is the God of angel armies. He is the Holy One of Israel. He is perfect in holiness and in righteousness. He is your Redeemer. He has bought you with a price. And He is the God of the whole earth. He rules over all of it. He controls all of it. And He is the one who looks at you and says, I want you with all of your baggage with all of your issues with all of your past I want you and what he says about you and what he has done for you that is what ultimately matters that's what matters not what everyone else thinks 
We can't control what people think about the things that we have done. It doesn't matter what social media thinks. It doesn't matter what the devil tells you to think in your mind. What matters is what God thinks. And he says, I want you. And then he compares us in verse 6. He says, for the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit. Like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. He wants us even though we are like a wife deserted. Now in this culture, to be a wife deserted, a wife cast off was terrible. You had no status. You had no property to call your own. You had no prospects. You were tainted goods. You had nothing to offer a prospective mate. God says, that's the state I find you in. All we come to him with is our sin, our failure, our mistakes, our shame. And he says, I want you just as you are. Even though you have nothing to offer me. In John chapter 6 verse 37. Jesus says. Whoever comes to me. I will, it, I will never cast out. Whoever comes to me. I will never cast out. John Bunyan. The author of the Pilgrim's Progress. Commenting on this very passage. Imagines a dialogue. Between Jesus and the sinner. Now of course. John lived a long time ago. And he was reading from the King James Version. And the King James translates that passage a little bit differently. Instead of saying, I will never cast out, the King James says, I will in no wise cast out. Now we may not say it that way today, but I want to preserve Bunyan's original words and read to you his dialogue between Jesus and the sinner. But I am a great sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I am an old sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I am a hard-hearted sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I am a backsliding sinner, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have served Satan all of my days, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have sinned against light, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have sinned against mercy, say you. I will in no wise cast out, says Christ. But I have no good thing to bring with me, say you. And Christ says, I will in no wise cast out. Your maker wants you. He wants you. But the second point this morning is his love is greater. Let's keep reading. Verse 7. For a brief moment I deserted you. But with great compassion... I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment, I hid my face from you. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Yes, God is angry with our sin. It's destructive. It ruins his creation. It just makes a mess of everything. And so, yes, for a brief moment, I deserted you. In overflowing anger for a moment, I hid my face from you. But listen to the contrast in the passage. Don't miss it. It's intentional. He says, for a brief moment, I deserted you. But with great compassion, I will gather you. For a brief moment, I hid my face for you. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you. Brief anger, everlasting love, brief desertion. Great compassion. Yes, sin is serious. God does deal with it. But his heart is a heart that overflows with love. That is the heart of God towards you. Just listen to the way that the Old Testament describes God dealing with our sins. He says he takes them and puts them on the bottom of the ocean floor. He casts them as far as the east is from the west. He has blotted them out. He has turned his back on them and he will remember them no more. And that's just the OT. It gets even better when you get to the new T. New Testament. You know what I'm saying. It's good. He has ever Lasting love. And he goes on in verse 9 and he compares it. He says, this is like the days of Noah to me. As I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you. will not rebuke you. He compares the fact that he is no longer angry. But is now pouring out his love to the days of Noah. You know, remember what happened in the days of Noah. Earth was wicked and corrupt. 
And so God sent a flood, but he preserved Noah and his family and the animals on the ark. He wiped everything out, but after the ark landed, what did he promise? He said, never again will I flood the earth. And he hung a rainbow up in the sky as a sign of his covenant. Never again will I pour out my anger in that way. And so God is saying, this is like the days of Noah. Never again will I pour out my anger on you. Never again will I desert you. Just as I never again have flooded the earth. Has the earth flooded since then, like it did in the days of Noah? No, God is good on his promises. And in Christ, when he was on the cross, God poured out his wrath and his anger for your sin and my sin upon Jesus at the cross. And as a result, he's not angry with you anymore. He has no wrath towards your sin. He was angry in a moment on the cross, and now what do you and I get? Great compassion and everlasting love. If we do experience discipline, it's the discipline of a father disciplining a beloved child. We don't have to fear his anger again. And shame is rooted in fear. It's fear of consequences. Fear of humiliation. Everybody seeing what I did. The stress of living with it. Of knowing I don't measure up to the standard that I I face judgment from God or for others. But the scripture says perfect love casts out fear. And it has the power to break shame. In God we are fully known. He knows all of it. And we are fully loved. But my guess is that even though some of you know that truth doesn't quite silence the shame. And ghosts of the past still haunt. When I was 13 years old, maybe 14, right on the line there, I loved playing video games. And we also had this brand new thing in the house called the internet. I know, I'm old. And nobody had really been on the internet much. Nobody really knew it was out there. But what I did find on the internet was the Nintendo website. That has video games for y'all the uninitiated. Okay? So I got on the video game website. And I love getting tips and tricks for playing video games. And I discovered that I could go into a chat room and talk with people around the country about video games. And it was one particular time when I was in that chat room and chatting. One of the people I was chatting with said, hey, this room is boring. How about we go somewhere more interesting? I said, okay. And so he sent me a link, and when I clicked on the link, it took me directly from there into a sex chat room. I didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't understand everything that I saw and read. But I hung out for a bit, left, and I was curious, like any young teenage boy. And so I went back again, and again, and again. And I was slowly discipled in the depths of human perversion and wickedness. And from there branched out into other sexual content on the internet. And through all of high school, I was a Christian kid. I was at church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I went to the True Love Waits rally and pledged to stay pure till marriage and followed through on it. But I couldn't break this habit. Now fortunately, it was the days of dial-up internet. (laughs) So the connection was slow. Y'all remember that? And the computer was in a public, semi-public room. So it was an on and off again thing. But then we went to college. And we were the first generation ever to be online all the time with laptop computers. What could possibly go wrong? And what I discovered is that I could go any time that I wanted and indulge my sin. Indulge these things. And what had been an on and off again struggle quickly became an addiction I would try to stop I I never accepted it I wanted it out of my life but I couldn't quit I would get free for a bit for a week for a month but then the accuser would come back and he would whisper in my ear and he'd say Brian this is not just what you do this is who you are and that guilt would bring me crawling right back to it and I felt all alone until I went to a conference while I was in college with thousands of other college students from across the nation. In the last night of the conference, the pastor, a man named Louis Giglio, stood up in front of us and he talked about my very sin. 
It turned out that in this room of thousands of college students, I wasn't alone. It was filled with people who had the same or a similar struggle. And the truth is today, I'm still not alone. I weep from my generation. Men in my generation, ages 30 to 49, three out of five have consumed pornographic material on the internet in the last month. Three out of five. In a survey of Christian college students in 2019, 89% 89 of the men at Christian colleges admitted to watching it at least occasionally, and 51% of the women. I think of the 10-year-old girl who said, Mommy, I don't want to watch this stuff, but I can't stop. I think of the 13-year-old who came up to me after a service and said, I have been addicted to this for five years. My parents know about it, but they've been unable to help me. I think about the mom of the 12-year-old who came and sat in my office and said, I looked at my kid's tablet and I found all of this intense content. And when I confronted him about it, he said, I have been stuck on it for two years. I think of the woman who called me up after one of my training sessions where I helped parents how to protect their kids from this stuff. She called and said, I thought I was getting this stuff for my kids, but I discovered that my husband has been on it and I don't know what to do. I think of the pop singer, Billie Eilish. If you don't know who that is, ask a teenager. Billie, in an interview, said she got hooked on violent content at the age of 11 and wasn't able to stop and was addicted to it. And as a result, it has totally messed with her life. 60% of pastors have struggled with it either currently or in the past. It's a reality out there. And in that moment, as I was sitting in that massive arena with thousands of others who could identify for the first time I felt not alone but I still felt the shame and that's when the pastor who was speaking said how many of y'all know Romans 3.23 <laughs> we all knew Romans 3.23 we'd memorized it in Awana for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God we all quoted it together out loud and then he did something I didn't expect. He said, and? We all blanked. He said, what's next? None of us knew. We only memorized Romans 3.23. And then he said something I'll never forget. He said, you know one of the best parts of the Bible is punctuation? Romans 3.23 doesn't end in a period. It ends in a comma. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace as a gift. He said, God has declared you not guilty. And for the first time in my life, the voice of the accuser was silenced and I realized I was not just a sinner. I was a saint. I was a holy one, declared not guilty and forgiven by the blood of Christ. And that changed everything for me. I went back after that conference and I told my roommates, guys, here's what I'm struggling with. And I got one of my buddies, and I said, hey, man, you're going you're gonna to have the password to my computer, and everything I do on the Internet is going to be sent to your email box, and it's going to filter all the websites. And he walked with me through it, and I was free. It was amazing. I met my wife. We got married. We both went into marriage as virgins, keeping faithful to that true love waits pledge, and praise God, we're the only two people we've only ever been with. But... See, this sin that I went back to would help me cope. It would help me numb the pain when life was difficult. So about a year after that breakthrough, I went back again. <laughs> but I had set my wife up to receive those same reports about everything that I did. So everything I had done in full detail was sent straight to her. Well, I didn't wait for her to come to me. I went straight to her and confessed it all. I thought our marriage was over, but I was surprised to receive grace and forgiveness. I'm not saying it was easy. It took months to rebuild trust and to learn how to walk through this together. But by the grace of God, we did. And no, I wasn't perfect. There were relapses. There were times I would fall back. But by the grace of God, through confessing it, through walking in repentance, and through improvement by the grace of God, many, many years ago now, I walked completely free. 
And today, I am blessed to have an incredible marriage where my wife knows all that we have done, all that I have done, and yet our marriage is full of gospel, grace, and love. We have a great marriage, ladies and gentlemen, not in spite of sin, but because of the gospel of Jesus Christ working through our sin. Doesn't mean that the hounds of shame still don't come barking. It doesn't mean that I don't regret the things that I did, but what it does mean is that God wove it together and he used it. What the devil meant for bad, God used for good and created a level of intimacy in our marriage that I don't know that we could have gotten any other way by the grace of God. What about you? Maybe this morning you can identify with my very struggle. I know some of you can in a room this size. Maybe for others of you, it's something else that happened on a screen. Something that you posted, something that you watched, something that you interacted with. Maybe you're here this morning and you have a history of self-harm. And while the scars on your body have healed, the scars in your mind have not. Maybe you're here and you just rebel against authority. You chafe against anybody who's over you and the adults in your life don't know what to do with you. Maybe you're here and you are so good at wounding with words. You know how to cut people straight to the heart. And you leave behind you a pathway of human wreckage. Maybe you've had real life sexual encounters that you carry with you. Maybe it's the way you've treated your family. If the walls of your house could talk, you would be horrified by what they would say. Maybe it's substances that you've put in your body. Maybe you have a record with law enforcement that you hope never sees the light of day. Maybe for you, it's not things you've done, but it was things done to you. The sin of others that has so infected your life that you carry it around as shame. Things said to you. A failure at work. A failure at home. A failure at school. Maybe it was abortion. I've known women who have walked through church who have a past in abortion. And they're terrified that anybody would know about it because they fear the judgment that would come upon them. Maybe for you it's debt. Maybe your your reckless choices have piled up a mountain of debt that you don't want anybody to know about. I don't know what it is this morning. Maybe I hit it, maybe I didn't. But when the enemy comes along, and he will come along, and begins to play the tape, or for you younger folks, begins to stream the video of what you've done, what on earth are you going to do? What do you do in that moment when it all comes crashing back in? Well, Isaiah has some advice. God has some advice for you. Let's read it. Verse 10, for the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. God says, whenever that tape begins to play in your mind, that video begins to stream, God says, go out and find a mountain. If you can't find one, Google one. That's the updated version. And you look at that mountain and you say, It is more likely that that mountain will get up and grow legs and walk over there than that God's love would ever walk away from me. I didn't say that. God said that. The mountains may depart, but my steadfast love shall not depart. The hills be removed, but my covenant of peace shall not be removed. That is what's true. And why can he say that? Because of what happened in Isaiah 53. Which describes when Jesus Christ goes to the cross and takes our shame and our sin and all that we've done. It says in Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all, all, all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way but God has laid on him the sin of us all. That's why we can trust in his love. So you're here and you're struggling with shame. The first thing you need to do is inhabit these truths and let them renew your mind. This is what is true. This is what needs to take ownership of your thoughts. But you also need to confess it to God. You need to own it and confess, God, here's what I did. If we confess our sins, John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all, all, A-double-L, unrighteousness. But it also means that we need to walk in repentance. 
That's what began with me when I went and told my roommates and put that stuff on my computer. We've got to walk in repentance. We've got to walk away. You're never going to break the cycle of shame if you're continuing to fall back into the same things. So we've got to walk in confession and repentance from God. And also, if our sin has affected or hurt others, we've got to go and make apologies to them. Confess it and ask forgiveness from others. Make things right as much as it is possible. And honestly, we need the help of others in this journey. If you're having a hard time believing God's forgiveness and grace, let me tell you, there is no substitute like having someone speak it to you. Like telling your sin to someone else and hearing them say back to you, you are forgiven in Christ. We may need others to help us to be accountable, to help us walk in the way that God would have us to walk. And people are good like that. I remember the first time I shared it with my roommates, I was terrified about how they react. And they were cool about it. Like college roommates often are. I remember the first time my wife saw the fullness of it. I was terrified, but I found gospel grace. <laughs> I remember the first time I up, stood up and shared this story with the church I was interim pastoring in 2014. I even think about this past summer, sharing it with thousands of kids at summer camps and seeing so many set free from shame. See, the truth is, I can't control what people think about me. All I can do is say, look what God has done in me and for me. And the same is true for you. The same is true for you. If you're struggling, we're here to help. We're here to help. You can reach out to me. You can reach out to my wife. If you're a lady, we'd love to support you and be there for you. Because that's ultimately what the church is for. God wants to break the power of shame in your life. Can I tell you something? Maybe you didn't know. Jesus did not die for you to walk in shame. Just one more time for the people in the back. Jesus did not die so that you could live a life of shame. He's better than that. The cross is bigger than that. And today he wants to break its hold in your life. As your maker, he wants you. And his love for you has overcome any of his anger that was poured out at the cross. And there is no reason to fear because nothing, nothing can take that away. But will you let him silence the shame in your life? When we lived in Georgia, Georgia has like zero laws about fireworks. I don't know why, but for some reason they just threw them all off the books years ago. And you can set off anything you want, pretty much any time you want, especially 4th of July. I mean, people are shooting up full fireworks in the sky, detonate nuclear missiles. There's really no limit. <laughs> and so when we moved to Georgia, we discovered this. And we also discovered that people like to set off fireworks, not just on the 4th of July, but anytime there's a holiday. We no joke had people setting off fireworks one time on Christmas Eve. And we're like, what are y'all doing? You're going to shoot Santa out of the sky. Come on now. <laughs> And I remember one particular time, it was a Sunday night, it was not a holiday, and some folks had decided to go out to the circle of grass just down from our house and to begin shooting off fireworks on a Sunday night, past 10 p.m., almost 11 p.m., the day before work and school. And I'm lying in bed, and I'm fuming, like I usually am when people are setting off fireworks, just squirming, but they aren't stopping. And so finally, I've had enough. I climb out of bed, I throw on some clothes, I bust out my front door, and I go walking down to the circle. And I spot them out there, set off the fireworks, and I look around. And our, our neighborhood is densely packed, right? I mean, there's, there's about this much space between the houses. So there are hundreds of houses, thousands of people. And I look around, and the lights are out in almost all of them. So there's all these people lying in bed, asleep, can't go to sleep because of the fireworks, but I'm the only one out there to say anything. So I go up there and I say, guys, look around you. It's almost 11 o'clock on a Sunday night. People got work and school tomorrow. What are you doing? They're like, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'd like to say I was nicer than that, but I don't know that I was in the spirit in the moment. Eventually they said, okay, we'll go. They packed it up and left. And I went back and I got my sleep. But it was funny because I was thinking about it. How many people lying awake, staring at the ceiling, but they're not going to move. They're just going to sit there and let those fireworks go off in their ears again and again and again. 
And I think a lot of you out there, some of you t- this morning, the fireworks of shame have been going off in your life. Some of you for weeks, some of you for years. And you're just sitting there hoping it'll pass you by, hoping it'll quit on its own. Not gonna. And I want to invite you this morning to join me. To step out and to silence the fireworks of shame. Because God has already silenced them in Jesus Christ. There's no reason for you to continue living with those fireworks going off in your life. It is time for you to get out the bed, put on your clothes, and walk out and say, Enough! I'm done with shame. I'm stepping out. Listen, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. I have control over my life. I want you to be done with it too. So I don't know what it is this morning. We are about to have a time of response. I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite us during this moment to respond to what God may be saying to you this morning. And I know in a room like this to say we're going to have a time of response might seem intimidating. What will people think if I pray or if I come down front? The first step to getting over shame is to stop caring about that. But listen, I just laid all my business in front of you. No one has thrown any tomatoes at me. You'll be okay. So if the Lord is moving this morning, in just a moment, I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. You're here and you say, you know, I don't know what it is in my past, in your past. I don't know if you're going through it now. I don't know if that shame is still haunting you. But in just a moment, we're going to respond. I'm going to be down front. Pastor Mike is going to be down front. The stage is open if you want to come and pray, if you want to put some action behind it today and plant a flag and say today is the day. You can grab another person in the congregation and have them pray for you. You can kneel right where you are at your chair and make that a place of prayer. You can just lift up your hands and sing. But however it shackled you today, whatever you're dealing with, We want to invite you to respond. Maybe you're here and you've never trusted in Christ. These truths are not true of you and you want them to be. We would love to help you receive Christ today. Maybe you're looking for a place to be a a member, to join in fellowship. We're a bunch of messed up people. We'd love you to come join us. Whatever your need, we're going to pray and I'm going to invite you to respond. Father, thank you so much for the good news of the gospel, for the truth of the love of God that has changed everything. And I pray this morning, Lord, that if there's any who are haunted by shame, that it has power over their life in any way, that today you would break that shame and you would set them free. If there's any who are struggling this morning, God, that you would set them free from that. And that, God, today would be the day that you shine your light and you set us free from the prison that we've made for ourselves. That's what Jesus came to do, to set the captives free. I pray that he would do it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.